Nick Cannon conversation. It's one of the reasons why I was late getting on, probably about 7.05, five minutes later, because I'm sitting there reading up on <laughs> on black Hebrews and it, the Hebrew black Israelites or whatever the name is, right? He, black Hebrew Israelites, like, there we go. I, I've known them to be here in Philly on different corners, spewing their information, right? Going on rants. Don't let a white person come by, walk by because they will let them have it. But apparently, Nick Cannon's belief in the black man being the, ori the original Hebrew has gotten him fired. So I'm going to play one of the videos and then read some of the comments that Nick Cannon has subsequently made with regards to being fired by Viacom. The only way they can, they, they have to rob, steal, rape, kill, and fight a flight okay. in, or, in order to survive. Exactly. So then these people who didn't have what we had, and when I say we, I speak of the mm -hmm. melanated people. Right. They had to be savages. They had to be barbaric. They had, because they're in these Nordic mountains, they're in these rough uh, torrential environments. Mm. So they, they're acting as animals. Right. So they're the ones that are actually closer to animals. They're the ones that are actually the true savages. And then they built up such this, this, I don't want to say warrior, but they built up such this, this, this conquering mm -hmm. uh, barbaric mentality. And so what you saw there was a clip from his YouTube show, Cannon's Class, where he was sitting down with, Pro with Pro Professor Griff, who's known for, for being associated with Public Enemy, who also was blackballed in the, in the late 80s for making what was considered anti-Semitic remarks. In that clip, Nick Cannon was talking about white folk and how white folk are the original savages, <laughs> right? And how they ultimately had to adapt because they, they when they went off into foreign land and then they, they, they adopted this, this barbaric mentality, which, we, which we've seen, right? We see these, and I can't recall some of these individuals that, that, that you know, we talk about in history, right? But they've adopted this mindset. And when I initially heard about Nick Cannon getting fired from Viacom, which houses his TV show, Wild and Out, which he considers a, a billion dollar uh, entity. I don't know how true that is, but I know it's definitely worth a lot of money. It's the only reason why a lot of people watch MTV, especially black folk. We know Viacom owns BET. We know they own VH1. And we recognize the type of content that are on those channels. And so here we have Nick Cannon on his on his Cannon class being open and honest about what he's learned with regards to history. Now, he's been under the tutelage of of some of our brightest minds, in particular, Dr. Gregory Carr, who is a professor at Howard University. Right. And if he is the the preeminent uh, black historian alive today, I've had the privilege of of meeting him several times, having him on my radio show. And he's a he's a thoughtful brother. He's a respectful brother, and he's a he's a loving brother. And so I know when Nick Cannon comes out and and starts to have these conversations and makes these type of comments with regards to to this specific Cannon class, I know it doesn't just come off the cuff. I know it's something that 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 he's thought about, because again he sat in, sat in Dr. Gregory's uh, Carr's class. He graduated from Howard University with a degree in criminal justice. Now, when we think about white folk, white folk do have a history of being violent, right? And one could, could, could say that violence is synonymous with savagery and being savage. Let's think about the person whose, whose statues We've been pulling down left and right. Christopher Columbus, he was a savage. He was violent. And so I completely understand the comments made, and, and I agree with the comments that were made by Nick Cannon on Cannon's class with regards to the history of white people, especially here in this country. 
we look at other continents, we look at Africa and how white folk have gone in and stolen the resources, stolen the resources, offering little in return. We see here in America in 2020, we're still talking about Black Lives Matter. That comes from a violent approach, right? That comes from a violent approach, having to say that. Why? Because those are the behaviors that have been exhibited by white folk for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we're only talking about here. We're only talking about here. Now, he's going on to, and, and I had to read up on it because I couldn't find the, 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 uh, the video for it with regards to the quote-unquote anti-Semitic comments that he's made. And so, I don't know how, how interesting this is, but this comes from the Jerusalem Post, right, where I was able to find some, some excerpts. And so, some of the... Some of the uh, the comments that he's made included. Let me see. So when he's talking about black folk being true, his true being true Hebrews, he said it's never hate speech. You can't be anti-Semitic when we are the Semitic people, when we are the same people, people who they want to be. That's our birthright. We are the true he, true Hebrews. Now, I don't know if he's a, a, he, a black he, Hebrew Israelite. And again, I'm not too familiar with, with the beliefs of the black Hebrew Israelite. So prior to getting on, I was doing my reading and I found it to be completely fascinating. Right. I found it to be completely fascinating where black Hebrew Israelites believe that they are the direct descendants of, of Abraham, Isaac, and somebody else from biblical times, right? That they're the direct descendants. And so this is, this is the issue that we run up against, right? Because we don't have documentation. We don't have data. What we have are <laughs> groups saying, listen, we are the originators. We Bobby Brown, right? We created this. This is us. And we have another group saying, no, that's not the case. Now, black Hebrew Israelites, from what I was, was reading, are saying that those Jewish individuals who occupy Israel now, they're just holding the fort down, right? Because the, the original black Hebrews, they were sent away. They were outcasts. And they had to go and roam Africa, right? Until they was captured and take it to America as slaves. I don't have anything to disprove that. And so when I when I sit here and I and I read this and somebody says this is anti-Semitic, I look at it as potentially being a differing of opinions. <laughs> right? Because again, nobody was around thousands and thousands of years ago. And yes, we have we have the Torah and we have these these different books that have been in existence for a long period of time. Maybe it's one of the reasons why I'm agnostic. Because listen, I'm okay with not knowing. I don't have to lay claim to, to anything in particular. Because I recognize I don't know the truth. Nobody knows the truth. We over here doing our best guest jobs. And the more people that you have believe, believing in you, the more we could purport it to be truth, to purport it to being truth. And so again, I'm not one, I can't sit here and say what is uh, anti-Semitic remarks. What I can say about Deshaun Jackson's comments, right, when you're quoting Hitler, <laughs> I can say that yes, that's anti-Semitic because we know Hitler wanted to kill Jews and did kill millions of Jews. But from what I read alone, unless there's some more documentation, some more information with regards to what Nick Cannon said, I can't specifically state that that's anti-Semitic in reasoning for him to get fired. So here was his remarks. I'm not going to read it in its entirety. He says, anyone who knows me knows that I have no hate in my heart nor malice intentions. I do not condone hate speech nor the spread of hateful rhetoric. We're living in a time where it's more important than ever to promote unity and understanding. 
This is important. The black and Jewish communities have both faced enormous hatred, oppression, persecution, prejudice for thousands of years, and in many ways have and will continue to work together to overcome these obstacles. He says, I am an advocate for people's voices to be heard openly, fairly, and candidly. In today's conversation about anti-racism and social justice, I think we all, including myself, must continue educating one another and embrace uncomfortable conversations, yada, yada, yada. And so he openly said, listen, I'm willing to have a conversation with somebody who's more well-versed in this than me. And I think once you say that, you're open and willing to learn to, 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 to get more information to whether either disprove what it is that you're saying or to affirm what it is that you're saying. We'll be all better off for it. And so Viacom coming out asking him to apologize for his anti-Semitic remarks. Nah, I don't necessarily know if an apology is warranted. A lot of time with, with black folk, especially, we're asked to apologize for our views on white people. I'm going to say it on white people. We're often told that we can't have uh, a difference of opinion in, the, in this uh, in this in this instance, a different of ideology. Because, again, it's the easiest thing you could throw out anti-Semitic. Seinfeld had a whole episode of that. Where they're making fun of Dennis saying they're anti-dentites. Right. We know here in America, you cannot say anything negative about Jewish folk. Maybe not coincidentally, you can do and promote whatever type of materials about black folk in a negative light. They could say the N-word. They could speak disparagingly about one another and you'll continue to promote it. So how, how, how committed to social justice and unity are you, Viacom? Right? Because you should say, listen, love and hip-hop, this doesn't paint the black community in a proper light, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a healthy and, and uh, positive light. I can't green light this. But no, they green light it. Why? Because it brings in the cash. And so Nick Cannon was all good because he was bringing in the cash. And then they want him to capitulate. They want him to apologize. Because why? I don't know who's the head of, of Viacom. And I don't want to feed into stereotypes about where the money is, right? Because I, I don't know. Would I be surprised if the head of Viacom was potentially Jewish? No. I wouldn't be surprised. If the decision makers were Jewish? No, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised. Just like I wasn't surprised uh, when the Eagles came out with a state a statement. Because why? Jeffrey Lurie is Jewish. But again, it's not even necessarily about the, the ethnicities involved. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I can't even say that. It is. Because it's the idea of, yes, and you'll hear people time and time again bring up Jewish people marching with black folk in the 60s. But Jewish people have also leaned into their whiteness, right? They have leaned into their whiteness to where black folk become their subordinates. We're no longer walking arm in arm because this is what happens in societies. There has to be somebody lower on the totem pole, unfortunately. And so if you're a Jewish people and you're being treated like the Negro, why would you want to be treated like the Negro? And how they've been treated for hundreds of years since they've been in this country. So yes, you might see some arm in arm. But no, Moskowitz could change his name easily. Right? Seinfeld could change his last name easily and assimilate into white culture. Black folk can't necessarily do that. Why? Because like Jay-Z says, still nigga, right? You won't know somebody Jewish unless they tell you. Yes, they might have some features that might, that might be related to the, but again, Jewish, Judaism is a faith. 
Now you might have questions, you might be able to guess right, but when it comes to Negroes, a Negro is a Negro is a Negro just by looking at them. And so we didn't have that same luxury to change our last names, to assimilate into white culture, that, that, that wasp, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture, and still practice our faith. And so with Nick, Nick doubled down, right? And so he came out with a few more statements. And I'm not going to play them all. I'm not going to show them all. He says, listen, I hold myself accountable for this moment and take full responsibility because my intentions are to show that as a beautiful human species, we have way more commonalities than differences. We all family. Again, he's not saying I apologize, right? What he's saying is, listen, I do want to bring about unity, but not at the expense of truth. And then lastly, he says, truth and reconciliation. I am deeply sad in a moment so close to reconciliation that the powers that be misuse an important moment for all of us to grow closer together and learn more about one another. Instead, the moment was stolen and hijacked, hijacked to make an example out of an outspoken black man. I will not be bullied, silenced, or continuously oppressed by any organization, group, or corporation. I'm disappointed that Viacom does not understand or respect the power uh, and he goes on and on and on and talks about how Viacom stole Wild and Out for him. Because initially I had posted about, well, why not take Wild and Out? You have a you have a, your own platform on YouTube. We have Diddy with Revolt. We have Byron Allen, who has some black channels. Maybe it's too risky for them to touch, right? Because they 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 have conversations that they they have relationships with Jewish individuals, so they might be deemed too risky. But as far as YouTube, you can go right on there, right, and promote yourself and promote your brand like you've been doing. But unfortunately, he goes on to say how he was bamboozled and swindled out of Wild and Out, and Viacom owns the rights to Wild and Out a billion dollar entity that he claims. And it became instantly frustrating because this is what happens. We tend to give our power away. We tend to sign our rights away just to get a, a, an eighth of the pie. There's a, a viral clip that's, that's circulating with Viola Davis talking about, and I love, I, I love me some Viola Davis. And she's talking about how she's won a Tony and Emmy and, and all of these different things. And she want to be paid like her white, white counterparts. And it, I'm taken back to Tyler Perry's BET speech. When he says, while y'all fighting at the table, I'm down in Atlanta creating my own. And that resonated with me. That resonated with me because again, here we are fighting to be a part of quote unquote their system. We want their accolades. We want their money. Like, yes, Viola Davis, you too talented. But at some point we got to say, we don't want to be a part of it anymore. And so what that means is I'm going to go to my people and I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust my people to potentially support me to get me where we need to be. Viola Davis was just on the cover of Vogue and they hired their first black photographer in the hundred or so year existence of Vogue magazine. They hired their first black photographer. And I, I don't care about that. My thing is black photographer. Why do you even want to go to them? Viola Davis, why do you want to go to them? Why is it this idea of, of being in the mainstream associated with being on white publications? Black photographer, why must you go to them and be their first, be their token Negro to say you did Vogue? And so I think about Nick Cannon. Now, now while and now has been around forever and it hasn't been a lot of Negro owned stations, unfortunately. And there weren't platforms like YouTube that exist where you can truly, truly monetize off of it. 
But again, this is where the frustration sets in. Because again, as much as we talk about buying black, as much as we talk about uh, blackout on July 7th or whatever day that was and all of that, when the opportunity arises itself and the dollar amount is put in our face, we go right to it. Now, I know Viola Davis has been on Essence numerous, on the cover of Essence numerous times. Is that not good enough? And again, this is something internal that we have to assess, that we have to address. Is it not good enough? Or do we complain about it, yet still go over there? So I was just reading a post by, by one of my favorite writers, Kaisei Lehman, and he was talking about his journey uh, in finding a finding a publicist, right? And it was an interesting journey to read, and it ultimately resulted in him selling. Listen, he had to sell thousands of books out out his trunk, like it's a mixtape. And I'm like, I understand, I get it, right? I understand, I get it. If that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. And how I relate to that is, unless it's black folk in these positions putting us on, we need to rely on us. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good white folk out there. And if you decide to go this route, my thing is, it's, it's, can we truly complain if we continue to buy into this idea? Can we truly complain? You know, I think about me once I have, if I, if and whenever I get this book done, am I going to sell it out the trunk? Or am I going to go to these people knowing, knowing that I'm possibly not going to get what I, I feel I'm worth just because of, you know, lack of experience, skin color, ethnicity, and I don't know, right? If a Simon and Schuster comes at me, right? And they say, listen, we're going to give you $100. I don't know what my response is going to be. And yes, I can be frustrated about it. But at the end of the day, it's on me. And so when I look at Nick Cannon, you know, I wish him well in his lawsuit against Viacom. I hope he has a leg to stand on. But again, at some point, we have to value us. And that's what it boils down to. So I'm glad he doubled down on it. There's no room for wavering. Once you put yourself out there and make statements like that. That's why people look at Deshaun Jackson funny. It's like if you're going to lean into it and lean into your blackness, then lean all the way in. Because nobody will, will accuse you of flip-flopping or being disingenuous. Love it or hate it, that's why people embrace Louis Farrakhan because he says, listen, this is who I am. I recognize that that, that part of the world, that white folk will not embrace me. And so I'm entrusting my black folk to take care of me. I believe in the collective. Again, lean into it. And that's apparently what Nick is doing. 